Hello and welcome back to Encounter Roleplay. It is me, Frost from Fire, with your weekly dose of roll-up on Fridays. Today we are discussing the Warhammer 4E system from uh, Cubicle 7, who are our partners here on Roll on Roll 20? No, what am I saying? On Encounter Roleplay. Ooh. Ooh. Things in my brain. Brain is in trouble, Charlie. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> Uh, but talking about virtual tabletop choice, our sponsors are also Fantasy Grounds, who we will be using uh, to roll up our Warhammer characters. We won't be starting that quite this week. We will be discussing what Warhammer is, why we love it, and how Jim likes to make characters. Because uh, our very special guest, Jim Davis, is bringing his very unique perspective on rolling. Because it would be boring if you just heard how I made characters every week. <laughs> So, so, Jim, who are you? Why are you my special guest? I well, wow, that's a good question. Uh, I am Jim Davis, uh, a co-host of, uh, of WebDM. Of course, we do uh, tabletop role-playing uh, advice videos and inspiration videos on YouTube. We we have our own uh, Twitch channel where we play D and D as well as other games. And I don't know why I'm looking directly into my mic for some reason. Uh, and uh, I'm in a new setup, so it's a little unfamiliar. I'm in Pruitt's setup uh, right now, so. Uh, because uh, I'm on vacation, uh, but so we're WebDM, right? Uh, if you haven't heard of us, uh, check us out. If you have heard of us, uh, thank you for hopefully enjoying the content. Um, but I also run a, a Warhammer game uh, over here on Encounter RP, and is was one of those one of those moments where I was like, "Hey, hey, Will, if you ever play Warhammer or run it, like." Hook me up, and we're like, well, let's just get you in the seat and and run it. That was last season uh, on Beneath Dark Bows, and it was a uh, a formative experience for me as a DM, and I'm really looking forward to the second season. So, why don't we talk a bit about Beneath Dark Bows? I think this is a good place. Like, that was a two-e campaign. I think it's a good place to start talking about what Warhammer is, Warhammer Fantasy in particular, because there are two kind of worlds to Warhammer, two kind of things. You've got the, the yes. fantasy and the 40k. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I mean, it, it's uh, Warhammer is sort of the, the in-house setting for uh, for Games Workshop, uh, which is a you know company that makes uh, games, and um, it, it's the fantasy version of of their in-house setting. Uh, their their Warhammer 40k refers to a different setting that that really takes place in like 40,000 years in our own future and is uh, a space fantasy sort of uh, just. Romp, um, but regular Warhammer or Warhammer fantasy role play is this uh, medieval or early modern Europe with the serial numbers filed off, uh, plus Cthulhu monsters and some stuff that uh, Games Workshop liked from RuneQuest, which I only really recently found out they took from, and and sort of jumbled all up and mixed up into its own uh, setting, which in the in the late eighties uh, was released as Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay uh, First Edition. Um, it's kind of an all in one RPG, and it has this really iconic uh, campaign associated with it, the Enemy Within, which is a lot of intrigue and and figuring out the, the plot of cultists and, and dealing going from like dealing with local village politics all the way up to you know uh, getting involved with, like the imperial court um it's a really iconic campaign and and it's a really that this it's it's this weird mix of dark fantasy and humor and 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 it, at least in the 80s versions like this political satire for sort of like uh making fun of and satirizing thatcherite england and 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 sort of in that vein it's it's also like the 2000 ad and judge dread kind of uh sensibilities um and it's just a fun i i played it was the first rpg i played um, I, I, I came from uh, the, the Hero Quest board game and through many steps got to Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. And I think it really made an imprint on me that my first fantasy setting that I really dug deep into and played was this dark, uh, sarcastic, pun filled um, setting where people would go crazy and have their limbs lopped off. And, they, and there's these monsters that, that can just be easily brought into the world that, that will drive you insane and um that, that's why I like that's old hammer right so like if we're talking warhammer and 40k there's even divisions between 
within the settings. And Old Hammer is that um, 80s first edition uh, sort of feel to it. It's the mud, blood, and shit Warhammer. It's you start out as a peasant and and just kind of have to work your way up and um, that sort of setting. And then it, the line got canceled and maybe revived or whatever and was brought back in um, second edition uh, Warhammer, which to me is very much inspired by the the early 2000s RPG boom. It reminds me a lot of like say third edition D&D with the addition of talents, sort of like feats. You've got skills, that a lot of the way the action economy works reminds me a lot of uh, third edition D&D. And there's even like if you read the if you read the, the rules of second edition Warhammer really closely, it's they use Dungeons and Dragons terms in the rules that are not in the Warhammer rules. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's really, uh, it, it's just, it was really striking uh, when I read it. But it's a refined version of first edition, um, and uh, it's got uh, it, it streamlined rules and and sort of a, an attempt to, to cut things down and, and make it a bit more action oriented. And the the setting had been updated by then. Warhammer was heroic, and it's it's golden armored emperor kings on griffins fighting hordes of orcs, and and you know chaos is not a, a an insidious threat that corrupts uh, the hearts of humanity. It's an eight foot tall iron clad warrior with pus all over him. You know, I'm really that, glad that we sort didn't of... meet one of those. I'm just gonna say that. Now. <laughs> but there, you could have. There was a well in beneath dark bows that had a what I called. Uh, uh, the Laughing God's Cauldron, and it was uh, a, a, just a big boiling cauldron of Nurgle magic. That just I, I like putting uh, really dangerous artifacts with like zero barriers for the players to, to acquire in, in a campaign. <laughs> like it's just in a hole. No one's guarding it. There's not a monster. You just, I'm you know, so sad we there. missed that now. Actually, I take it back. I'm sad we missed it. <laughs> Right. Uh, <laughs> the system, so much the same as Cthulhu, you're aiming to roll yes. belief a target number. Yeah, yeah. And it's, I, I think there's probably a connection between the, the other D100 systems out there, like, um, like Call of Cthulhu or RuneQuest and Warhammer. I think it's probably uh, inspired by them, or if not, just like, hey, we're going to use this yeah. system. Um, so that's the sort of the setting in a nutshell. Right, it, yeah. and, and whether you like your Warhammer uh, grim and gritty and, and low-powered or heroic and, and fighting the hordes of these iconic Warhammer monsters, the setting kind of works for either, or the system, mm -hmm. rather, works for either, and it's it's pretty versatile. Uh, I, I just love it. It's uh, Every time I play it, I'm, I'm like, why don't I play this more often? So, yeah, that's my recap, I guess. <laughs> so how would you characterize your Warhammer? Like, what is your ideal Warhammer fantasy game? Because obviously we're going to have to build Ooh. some characters at some point in the next we three weeks. And uh, I, I like to come up with a hypothetical game that they're going to be in. I was going to okay. steal our current game, but I don't want to do that. I want to come up with Jim Davis's sitting down at a table, getting to finally play his Dream Hammer. Okay, what, what Dream Hammer. Dream Hammer would take place in the the events following my running of the Enemy Within. So I, uh, Warhammer veterans will know that the Enemy Within is it comes in five parts, and the first three are amazing, and the second two are, <laughs> and so uh, I ignored the second two. <laughs> they got done with Bindheim. Uh, I was like, hey, you guys go to this uh, fantasy Russia for a, a year and come back. Like we completely took an entire part of the module and I reduced it down to like a summary. Um, and uh, so I, I spun off my own events out of that. There was a religious civil war and a, and a cult uprising. And I, I would want to plan a campaign that took place during then. It, it's very inspired by, to me, like the, the Dutch Revolution. I'm a huge history nerd, right? So uh, the Dutch, the 80 Years' War, the Dutch Revolt, the, the 30 Years' War, the, the big one in the middle of the uh, 17th century. Um, and just like as all the factions in the Empire start fighting each other and they succumb to a civil war, basically. And I like settings where... Uh, things are unstable and and dire. I, I, I'm settings where everybody's just kind of getting along, and there's not, uh, you know, there's not a, a a struggle amongst uh, a lot of moving parts that they don't interest me as much. Uh, Game of Thrones is another one of these where it's like all the houses against each other, and and nothing's ever stable. It's always a, a shifting equilibrium. Um, and so I'd, I'd put in something like that. So I'd highlight like the divisions within the empire in the campaign. Like, are you a Sigmarite? Are you an Oregon? Uh, I honestly, my I, my Dreamhammer campaign devolves with everyone succumbing to chaos and either becoming cultists or sorcerers and summoning demons. Like I, that's the that's the campaign I really want to play. Where it's like you guys are cultists and 
you've got to make it as long as you can and and you know your end goal is to summon a lord of pleasure or a keeper of secrets or you know whatever but uh good luck and you know what <laughs> just, i'm hearing uh, right now i'm hearing warhammer season three on encounter roleplay <laughs> oh yes oh yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. oh well and then this like it, we, we can talk about like yeah uh, yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's what i hear as well no. <laughs> as well as like half a dozen uh, so half a dozen we have this, this setup we have that there's a lot of factions going on there's war it's yes. gritty chaos is raining yeah. uh yeah. how do you approach making a character for that setting what, what is your method when you get given a handbook and you're told this is the system we're playing how do you go about <laughs> making a character I, I like to start with uh, lore first, uh, and, unless it's a system I'm really, really familiar with. I usually don't start mechanics first. Um, you know, I, I want to start with a, a an image or an idea or a concept or something, something that 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 I can sink my teeth into and like really, uh, really enjoy playing. Because a lot of times for me, I've, I've learned that I, I'll, I'll my first instinct of a character is very often not the one I should play. Uh, I, my, the first, like the first one I make or the first one that I, I come up with is usually sort of based on my impulse and sort of like, Oh, this is awesome. And, and not necessarily what I'm going to sat, what I'm going to be satisfied by eight, nine, 20 sessions into a game. And, uh, so very often, and, and people who DM for me, uh, know that I, I usually within three sessions, I'm like, I either want to make a major change to my character or not. Uh, I, I know Pruitt's the same way. <laughs> My brother's the same way. We our home group sort of evolved around this constantly shifting characters method, and so nobody. I, I don't come to the table with um, a lot of backstory, a, a lot of uh, a lot of stuff that's hidden. I, I like to just have an idea in my head. Uh, what's the concept? What's the 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 uh, you know like an image or something? And then as play goes on, I'll like. Try to find places to uh, interject some backstory that's relevant to the, that moment in the game, and and to tie my character's backstory into the game. Um, the exception to this is if the DM is like, "Hey, I'd appreciate some some ways that you can connect with the campaign world like before the game begins," because I'm trying to like work that into the the hooks that I'm making. Uh, in which case, it's like, "Oh yeah, sure. You want me to give you ammo so that we can have a game? That's no problem." <laughs> uh, <laughs> Never That's, give kids ammo. <laughs> right, or pets. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I just I, I like to, um, I like to, to figure it out during the game as opposed to having a solid idea for it. And uh, so that's that's how I'd make uh, a character for almost any setting. But I mean, it starts with the lore. It starts with like reading, uh, which includes like the dungeon masters or game masters' plans for that. Uh, that game, it's like give me the lore of the the setting and also what what you where your head's at, DM. Like, uh, yeah. and and that from that I'll I'll cook up something that I think will be fun for me to play in that game. Having been a DM, has that changed how you are as a player, or does how you are, or is how you are as a player informing how you DM? Super curious, you because you are a very experienced DM. You are web mm -hmm, DM. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> I am. Um, uh, yes, for me, it's very much. Um, I I am a, a DM first, and I get uh, easily bored by a lot of traditional games as a player, because I I am I'm, I'll be honest. This is my this is my uh, confession. I'm not a very good player in the sense. I, I like I want to be in every scene. And and I want to be uh, involved in all the things. You're picking a lock. Can I help with that? Can I can I watch your back? Can I check a thing? Can I listen? Like I'm I'm that kind of of player because I've DM'd for so long and started out DMing. The DM's in every scene. The DM has input all the time. And so when I sit down to play, it's hard for me to switch gears in my head and say I'm not supposed to be in every scene. I'm not supposed to be uber competent at everything so that I can, my character can always contribute. It's okay that I sit this one out. And that's just like a, you know, personality thing with me. I, I just, I get eager and, <laughs> and want to cold. jump in. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I like games that offer a lot of um, player control over the narrative or, or uh, being able to set a scene, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know. I, I may love Warhammer. I've never actually had a chance what? to play game never actually I had, played I, that yeah. I was gonna ask you what other characters have you played but you've you've never had the chance 
I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I, when I first started, I made, I like, I made a bunch of characters and would like do a solo game. Like I ran Odin Holler contract for myself, uh, which is the uh, starting book in the first edition core or the starting adventure in the core, core book. And it's not fun. It, you know, it, it, when you're first starting and I, and I was like probably 11, it was fun. Cause it's like, you've never rolled dice before and, and learning how to read a D 100, uh, from just, you know, 2d10 that I, I don't even know where I got 2d10 from, honestly. Um, and trying to figure out how all this works uh, was was fun, but it's not a, you know, I don't consider it having played in a game. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, I have never actually played uh, Warhammer. I've always uh, been the uh, been the game master. All right, so there so you I go. Guess a new question <laughs> and a slightly <laughs> reformulated question. Uh, yeah. From Beneath Dark Bows, if you'd have had to swap places, one of us became the DM and you had to take over one of our characters, which character would you have wanted to play? Oh, that's... oh. And we had uh, Matthias, Rat, mm-hmm. Nora, yeah. Eamon, and Alero. For those who didn't watch, Alero was an archer, an elven archer. Matthias was a human heresy magnet, uh, who was a witch hunter, played by Will. Mm-hmm. Nora was a warrior dwarf. Yeah. I've got my own character. There was Yidris, who Yidris. was a bodyguard mm-hmm. interrogator. <laughs> and Rat, like, who was our... I was like, wait a minute, I'm missing someone. Um, and Rat, who was a halfling... That's right, he was a halfling. That's the, uh-huh. yeah. He was yeah, a halfling, a rat catcher, turned... Cat burglar, who yeah, who had a yeah. rough time. <laughs> had a rough time of it. Gosh, it's tempting. It's tempting. I, it's tempting to pick Will because then Will would be in in the DM seat. But then I don't think I could do Matthias justice. Like I, I just don't think I could. So, um, I think Charlie. I would. I think I would play Yidris. Quite honestly, I, I like the I like sort of like the character around Yidris and and the the, the way that uh, she evolved and sort of like the, like from the beginning of like yeah like a, a henchman and interrogator uh, and then some of the things that we had talked about like you like in the very beginning you were like oh I might like to go this direction uh, with Yidris and then of course when once the game begins all those plans um, you know the, the game sort of takes priority um, yeah. but yeah I would play Yidris and 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 then put you in the hot seat. No, I mean, I guess Yedris is a solid choice based on what you said about wanting this evil descent into madness with cultists, because that was very much Yedris's journey. And the way characters in Warhammer work for people who aren't familiar is you you pick a career. You don't pick a class, you pick a career, and that's kind of where you start. And if you don't want to choose, you can randomly roll, which is something really beautiful. Yeah, I I loved the random character generation. I I loved the... um, I love that I can sit down and not know who I'm going to play and then discover a character. And then the challenge of having to make that character work. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's, there's some things about like the career system that, that I think Warhammer could better explain. Um, to me, one of the things from at least my experience is mostly with first and second edition Warhammer, not uh, third. And I, I just haven't had a chance to play that much fourth yet. Um, but with like, there's a, there's not a lot of guidance on what does it mean to switch careers? What does it mean to, to progress through a career? Uh, presumably these are your character's day jobs or occupations or things like that. Um, so for me, it's like, I, I, I like the idea of discovering that, uh, that character randomly. And then I, I, one of the things is the promise of getting to like, figure out how the careers work. What does that mean? Um, I don't know. I remember I, I, when we were leveling up for beneath that bows, it became a case of what, fits my character's journey and what skills would they have been gaining experience in and building up and it became less about the job title really fitting especially Uh with rat uh i remember like his his journey was was so special for him yeah it wasn't a handbook journey it was not and in many ways i think rat would be a a better expressed through fourth edition than second because rat could just stay rat catcher and and not Mm -hmm. have to find a career where the skills and, and talents work but the, the flavor of it doesn't. Um, and there's others. It's part of the reason why I started, and this happened during my Enemy Within campaign, I started letting uh, players select options outside of their career because they were like, well, this, you know, this career isn't 
working entirely for me or, or I've, I find myself doing other things than what my career would suggest. And I was sitting there going like, well, you guys have been like absent from your hometowns for months. It's like, you're not, <laughs> you know, you're yeah, not you've like, been sacked this is, by now. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> you know, it's not like this is your occupation anymore. This isn't, uh, you know, what you do. Um, you, you know, you really are a, a champion or a, or a, you know, a mercenary. Um, that's this expresses more of, of what it is. And then I found myself wanting to make custom careers uh, for just that. So I decided uh, on a simpler solution of just like, yeah, you can just spend extra to get anything you want. Um, and you can stick with your career and that'll, that'll be cheaper for you, but you can open it up and just be like, yeah, pay, pay a little extra and then pick a, pick a talent, pick a skill up, pick a characteristic increase. And that's and what happened of, with, with the address. So she went yes. from bodyguard to interrogator, which is within her chain as per 2E. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I said to you, like, I, I wanted to go physician. Like, in my head, that was the concept. I wanted to go physician because I love the dark humor in that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But having played your dress, and she went through this terrible time. Thank you, Chaos Chorus. Uh, she went through this terrible time, and she became more and more entrenched in Matthias's doctrine and within the fight. And so mm -hmm. I went to Judicial, judicial Champion, um, and that was Yudris's final career. Which did cost me right. the 200 XP to hop, but it felt so much more right. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, I like that kind of approach to character generation where the, 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 what happens during the game um, you know, affects your character the most. And I, I'm thinking to like other systems where you sort of build your character at, as you go, as, as you level up. It's, it's not like I select this and then I get these things. You know? um, I'd contrast that with like 5th edition where you... By third level, you've made your major choices for the character, and mm -hmm. and they're they're largely just progressing through those choices as you level yeah. up, unless you do like feats. But Warhammer is one where you kind of build your character as it goes, and I I think that like the rules should yield to the game, and if if the character is played in a way that that clashes with the career system, then it's the career system that needs to to change, um, because I love that organic um, uh, approach to 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 making a character and seeing and them grow. The thing I like about the Warhammer thing with the career is it's a career, but that's not all you are. And you have, you know, some extra skills around that sometimes. And yeah, there is yeah. that that amount of tailoring that can go on. That's kind of similar to K uh, Call of Cthulhu, which we've obviously discussed like the last three weeks, mm -hmm. where you have, you know, your job, but you have other things around that and you're more free to move. Whereas when you're a class, it's like, okay, you can multi-class, but you're still a cleric with like two levels of druid. Yeah, Whereas this yeah. is like, you're a rat catcher, but you may have just started interrogating a whole lot of people in the town of Horno. And uh, exactly. you're, you're right. progressing into a witch hunter, <laughs> thanks to the uh, tutelage of a kind and generous overseer. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I think it speaks to like the fact that that Warhammer ha is grounded in in very like real world sensibilities, and, and it's it's easy for me to like portray the setting because. Uh, it, you know, it's it's a little bit more grounded, a little bit more down to earth, and and the fact that it's not, um, you know, the, I think like the class system gives a certain uh, heroic archetype, and and sort of reinforces a lot of genre tropes and things like that. Whereas a career system and a skill based system is is trying to impart something different through the rules. It's like this is about regular people, um, mm -hmm. and, and that's what I like the most about Warhammer is the fact that these are just regular people and and only a, a, a trick of fate has made them uh you know put them yeah. in here put them in a the position they're in or something like that yeah because i remember when i was random rolling for the 48 hour con i random rolled my character and i got artist mm. and of yeah. all the people to go on an adventure i was like how does an artist end up on an adventure right so that was a really interesting thing and i think um when we do start making characters what i'm gonna do is i'll do a random roll and I, because the way I like to build characters, I like to figure out how it makes sense yeah. and how it ties into the world. Um, and I think we'll go with the evil cultist idea. And maybe I'll post some <laughs> questions on my Twitter so chat can contribute some ideas. Ooh, what yeah. What the story is going to be. That sounds fun. Yeah. I, so, it's just, the, it's a challenge, right? Like, so what'd you do with the artist? Like, how did you justify it then? Uh, I justified that they also were trained as a fighter, that they were going out to capture some inspiration for some murals for a lord, mm -hmm. that um, they had turned their paintbrushes into shanks because weapons are really expensive in Warhammer 4E. 
and they were not very rich. Um, and yeah, that was the story is just because I was an artist, it didn't mean I was weak and weedy. I was perfectly capable of uh, killing Pruitt the dog uh, and fighting <laughs> Jim Davis, the evil overlord. Thanks, Will yes. and chat. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And that was, yeah, that was the arc is, because I think it almost challenges you to fight the trope, to figure out how does this work in a group setting where this is a real person. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, and you're not like a good hero. Sometimes you are, you do become selfish and you're like, I don't want to walk into that fight. And right. that's almost as interesting a story as going in and having the heroic fight sometimes. Well, and, yeah, and it, there's something about a, a system that is has deadly combat, and Warhammer a, across at least the first two, and, and I'm hoping the fourth edition, has been known for, for, for deadly combats. And I think it there's something about knowing that every time your turn is up, you're making decisions that will have uh, consequences for, for you as a player and, and for the game. Like, something's going to change. And so there's no such thing as a a consequence-free fight in Warhammer in that regard. Somebody's going to get, at the very least, somebody's going to get bloodied or bruised or, or something. But as we saw, people got cut in half, disemboweled, throats cut, limbs lopped off. Um, I and stepped out. <laughs> right. Just, it's, it's, absolutely, um, it's absolutely brutal. And, uh, and I, I, ironically, I was using uh, critical hit charts that were actually more uh, favorable to the players than the ones that are in the core rulebook, which are really <laughs> deadly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I did love that table. It was a it great was, it's table. It's really fun. It's really fun. That's the third time That's I've used a, those tables. It's really fun. Big change between 2E and 4E, because I remember on the 2E tables, we always wanted to roll, I think it was high, because those were, no, low, because those were the low, more deadly. Yeah. Ones, right, well, yeah, when yeah. we're rolling for someone else, when we're rolling for ourselves, we want to get the other direction. <laughs> right. Whereas in 4E, you really want to roll high on that table when you're hitting an enemy because that's where the death is. Because mm -hmm, that's mm -hmm. the thing, is it's not a case of uh, hit point attrition so much, although there is a point in 4E where it's like you've crossed the threshold and you're down. Yeah, and then you've yeah, got I a think... long time to heal. Yeah, you got just a little bit of time to heal. Most healing, it, it takes a long time. Uh, and, and in a longer Warhammer campaign, it creates uh, these lulls and, 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 and there'll be t moments of tension. And it's a tense game when, when the blades are drawn and your character's life's on the line. I've, I've run several big combats, not just in Beneath Dark Bows, but we did one in Enemy Within where the, the party organized a bunch of rangers and, and sort of outlaws to attack a, a castle that had been taken over by uh, these cultists and, the, and this noble family who had given themselves over to degeneracy and, and sorcery. Uh, and it was this running battle as they moved from like gatehouse to the towers and like archers over here are firing on this wall and into the courtyard and there's little combats and duels all over the place. Um, I never found combat to be that much of a drag, but I know a lot of people uh, say that Warhammer combat could take a while. Uh, but those tense moments, and then if someone gets injured, you might, might need three weeks to heal up. And that creates a sort of what do you do during three weeks? And it doesn't have that breakneck pace that a lot of uh, campaigns have. Now, Beneath Dark Vows was different, and uh, we put you guys through things that I don't think regular Warhammer characters would have been able to survive. <laughs> like, like they would have <laughs> broken. <laughs> I mean, we weren't in quite in one piece, but we were lucky, yeah. I think, that as much as chat sent us enemies and wild magic that hurt us, they sent us things to fix us, to let us yeah. be... Our own Magic little mini items. epic heroes. Yes. Because yeah, I think, and... in, in all fairness, Yidris and Nora should have died in the middle of that campaign after mm -hmm. actual cannibal Sheila Buff shows up. Yes. <laughs> Monster <laughs> that, that was. That was one of my favorite bosses. Um, I wasn't expecting him to be as... Uh... As good as he was, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but you're right though. Like, there's that. I think there is something like the fate point is what allows characters to escape those it's fates, really right? Mechanic. Yeah, and, and fourth edition expanded on it with resolve and resilience, um, and, and and turning that like I I had always allowed uh, or, or house ruled, house ruled early on that um, players could spend fate points permanently to ignore the effects of an injury, like Rat did when Miss Mrs. I, um, or uh, you know, spend them as fortune points to sort of ignore the temporary effects of insanity or something. And so fourth edition, taking that and splitting it up into uh, fate and resolve. And I I'm really curious to see what it looks like because I like how the two 
stats are, are as mm-hmm. important to your character as strength and weapon skill and anything else because you know resolve is something that's in you your character has a drive and a motivation and a and an intensity to get them through these horrific moments uh, but fate is something that's bestowed upon you from from whatever I, my interpretation of it, fate is is the with the workings of chaos right chaos is not evil chaos is just chaos uh, and the people, the people, people of the Warhammer world are the ones who summoned the Blood God. Like they're the ones that call this thing up. Like <laughs> you know, that's that's sort of my uh, take on it. Mm-hmm. And so fate is like the workings of that is is uh, is how that's expressed. And like I said, it's it's important because your agility and initiative and and all those other stats. So yeah. it, it's it's interesting. But there are times where as a DM, I'm like, God, well, I really just wish that. They just, I just wish that Nora had gotten her throat slit, in, or Gidris had gotten her throat slit, and right. Nora had gotten cut in half. But just that's, I think yeah. that's more than fair. And I know yeah. when I'm a player, since we're talking about how we play characters and we make characters, when I'm a player, I sometimes like going with actually, I'm not going to spend a fate point here or a fortune here. I'm going to take it because in this moment, it means more to me that I fail than it does to have an easy win. And there is that mechanic yeah. within Warhammer where it's on the player and the DM to figure out how this turns into a win by spending the fate or fortune. Yes. Yeah. Well, yeah. It, yeah. That's the other thing. Is it, yeah. yeah. You're not supposed to just let them walk away from it. And if we were in a long-term game and and that and we had had that scene where, where two characters had, had died in one fight, two very, two very gruesome deaths, right? Um, is it in something like that? Then it then it that see that's period where Nora and Yidris are being uh, tended to by the Zoet underneath the tree might have stretched mm-hmm. for a lot longer. It might have been like yeah you're, and, and then it it might be like yeah Yidris comes back but Yidris can't talk, <laughs> you know yeah that, uh, you I know, know or, or you know Nora can't use her left arm. <laughs> yeah. When that was happening, I was very much weighing up: do I you know accept that this is Yidris's fate in this moment? Um, and just not spend the point, or do I spend it? But I spent it because I felt that we'd come so far, and we'd just been through the exorcism scene, and yes, we only yeah. had a few weeks left of the campaign, so we had a, like a limited window, and it was like, I've come this far with this character, I feel like Fortune might sp- smile on her in this moment, and we get to see a bit more of the, the after effects of other things that have happened to her, whereas if we cut it there, we were going to lose you know, the benefit of having gone through the exorcism and the changing relationships. Yeah, yeah. The exorcism was probably my favorite moment uh, in the campaign because the, I forget how the book got introduced. I think it was a, a chat donation. It was a wild magic, yeah, it was a wild it was magic. like an item that they wanted a cursed item. A cursed item. I, I had, I had, you know, I've, I've come to the opinion that that these the 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 magic items and artifacts and things that are in RPG rule books should be used. And, and I got tired of say, looking through a D and D book and seeing all those cool artifacts. I never get to use those. And so yeah. I just make a point of like, I had Tome of Corruption open. I was like, let's look at, they've got a chapter on cursed tomes. Like, let's see which one would be awesome. Well, let's give this one that will, that will always leave Yidris the option to become a chaos champion. Like it's, it's always in the back of her head, like that truth that you read. And I, I like the idea of, a character having to go insane to read to mm-hmm. understand this thing, and um, and then once understanding it, being stuck with something permanent that that that's changed within them, and so it was a really cool item. And having the the sort of the Matthias briefly channeling Sigmar and and, and seeing the demons that were actually afflicting uh, Idris, and a lot of that was related to how I conceived of the Chaos Chorus. I and this is sort of like specific to, to DMing on the Encounter RP, yeah. but I was like, the Chaos Cores are actual demons, right? Like this is, <laughs> these they are the influence of the warp on the reality of the game. Yeah. And my villain wants to understand that. Um, and so might have uh, given Yidris a tome that would uh, push her along that path as well. And like, you'll see, you'll see the Matrix soon. Kind of. And I think... <laughs> it was like, just great. We... Oh, it was a great moment. When we start making your character, I think we're gonna see like your openness to the bad things is gonna is gonna come through. <laughs> how, how would you yes. feel like as a player if that if that happens to you? Is that something that excites you as a player or only excites you as a DM? It excites me as a player. I I want really interesting stuff like that to happen. I I the only thing that I don't like as a player is when something completely arbitrary and random means I can't 
do this thing anymore. Like I've got I you know and and as much as I like like old school D and D and stuff, the the saber dies sort of like this thing was poison, saber death, uh, or this spell targets you, saber death. Like I'm okay with that in that particular context of a game because it takes like two seconds to make a new character. Um, but in the context of something like. Uh, Warhammer or, or another game where you can really get invested and it takes a while to make a character and, and, and the like, um, then I'm fine with interesting things happening, bad things happening, things that change them. Uh, all that stuff is interesting to me. If they're just static, if they never s- experience adversity or, or something, a setback, or, 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 or don't come out changed and maybe not for the better, like I, I want to experience that in, in the game. It, it feels more mm-hmm. authentic to me. So... I, I like it for both, but yeah. All right, so I think we have a few minutes left, and I'm going to open it up sure. to questions from chat. We did have one earlier from Hasta King in Yellow, who asked oh. about playing the evil races. Um, and oh, in four E at the moment, in the handbook four E, it is the standard four races of human, dwarf, halfling, and elf. Uh-huh. But in earlier editions, what happened is you usually got the expansion and the module modules that contained, I believe, playable races. Um, and ways of, of being those races. But I would say, because I'm this sort of person, you could easily take one of the races and just reskin it and say, this is what a Skaven looks like. I don't oh, know how yeah, you yeah. feel about that. I I reskin all day long. Uh, yeah, I, to me, the one that was uh, I, that I uh, that I thought was missing from second edition was an orc supplement. Orcs in Warhammer are very different than than sort of like your standard uh, kind of orc and i think it'd be fun to play like a a group of, of orcs in a in a war band that have to gain renown and, and reputation with their war boss and work their way up the chain and eventually have to deal with rivals and and inter-clan uh, strife and then eventually it culminates in a log that you know as they burn uh, their way across the countryside um and but you could i, I mean like it, it, it's the simplicity of the system like character creation is complex but the system itself mm-hmm. is really simple which means that you can easily just say like well how what like when we're rolling that 2d10 what should the orc get as a bonus for weapon skill you know we already know what dwarf gets they're kind of a, a another similar like martial uh, race um second edition had the skaven supplement and it was really cool about how to role play skaven how to how to experience their society i played a skaven game in a heartbeat yeah, come on, let's bring all that the bad guys and just play all of them. That kind of follows into Libris' question, which is, what is Jim's dream supplement? New races, Dark Elf sourcebook, Lustria campaign, etc.? Uh, it's like a couple of dream supplements. I want to know what's on Albion. Um, that I feel like that it's one of those, it's like a, a big question mark to me. And the same with like uh, the, the, the places that are beyond that, whatever it's called, the, what would be in... Turkey, I guess, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> or the real world, the, the desolation right. where all the dark uh, dwarves live. Uh, what's beyond there would be interesting. I I know what's uh, I know it's an old I know it's in the old world. I know what's in Norska and Bretonia and, and Ulthuan, and uh, I, I don't know necessarily what's in Astalia or Araby or or the the other human parts of the uh, of the world. I guess really is anything beyond the the old world and the Bretonia that are that are human Dude. is what I'm uh, looking for. And what's yeah. cool to me as someone who was very new to Warhammer, I knew nothing about the law. Is the fact that it doesn't matter if you don't know anything about the law, you can still play this game. Oh, and yeah. Depending on how much your DM knows, how much your team knows, you can slowly build that because people, as you say, are everyday people. Everyday people don't know everything that's going on, and especially not at high yeah. levels, especially not world Absolutely levels. Not. And yeah. so. If anyone's feeling like slightly intimidated because it feels like there's a lot of lore, that is. But also, it doesn't matter. You can learn it as you go. Yeah. Your DM is probably going to shape it in the way that Jim obviously leans towards old hammer stuff. Uh, some DMs are going to lean towards the Age of Sigma stuff. Right. And it, it's it's very much like D and D in that respect, where there is lore there. You could have all of the Fey Run lore, or you could know mm-hmm. none of it, and you're still going to have a great adventure. Yeah, um, yeah. There's there's a lot about a lore heavy setting like that where because you sort of like soak yourself in it as a as a you know a source of entertainment and, and the like, it's 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 difficult to uh, or I guess it's rather, it's easier to forget <laughs> that the average person in that setting doesn't know anything about chaos. They they've never seen a demon. They don't know how any of this works. They've never witnessed magic or, or anything. They know you don't go into the woods at night. Like that's right. obvious. Um, 
and and maybe they've seen a beast man or, or something uh, if they're like a you know live in a out, out in the middle of nowhere. But it's not like uh, you know we see the perspective from the lore from the heights of the setting. Mm-hmm. And Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is about the uh, the depths. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> so I think for next week, I hope everyone comes back because we are going to start looking at the, the mechanics and start building characters. And I think what we will do is we're going to build an orc using the concept of reskinning and build Ooh. someone who wants to obviously climb the ranks with his clan. And we're also going to build a cultist who is... Sweet. Probably like a regular human being, maybe, dwarf. Maybe we'll run and roll that to see. Um, then we I'm can do both of Jim's dream campaigns in one go. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. I'm going to facilitate getting to do both your dream campaigns in one go. Awesome. Excellent. So, <laughs> yes. Um, and if anyone is looking for dice, don't forget to check out Tabletop Loot. If you are looking for minis and other D&D and RPG goodies, go and check out Wayland Games, both of which sponsor them. I totally forgot to mention at the start because I was so like, I want to talk Warhammer with Jim. <laughs> And a major thank you to Jim for coming. I am looking forward to next week already. Where can we find you for the rest of the week coming? What oh my goodness. Well, I, I, uh, I, I'm on vacation right now enjoying my uh, time off, but I will be back in time next week for um, Warhammer here on Encounter RP at um, I switched time zones and now my sense of Corona, Corona whatever is all messed up. It's in the <laughs> afternoon. Uh, it's after Call of Cthulhu. Just Yes. Turn it on we'll and count on on Wednesday and just don't even change the channel. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that is very true. Like I stand by that as well. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll except we will. Or 4 p.m. Eastern, that's right. Uh, and then um, I, after that, I'll be on uh, Invisible Sun on our channel, uh, Twitch channel. So uh, come check us out if you want to see us play Invisible Sun, which is this really cool game uh, from Monty Cook Games that's surreal and weird. And I haven't gotten to play in two weeks, so I'm excited to get to play uh, next week. Um, and then we got my uh, D&D campaign, Land Between Two Rivers, on uh, Thursdays. And gosh, where else am I? We have a Patreon if you like listening to the Improved Talk. We do. Uh, and otherwise, uh, I'm on Twitter. That's where I'm most active on social media. Come check me out and uh, find out the sort of uh, drama that we get uh, involved in. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, I'm about to hop us into the, the tunnel. We're going to do our second dice giveaway of the day, and then we will be coming to you with some dragon building. So thank you very much, Jim. I will see you next week. Thank you, Chat. I will be back in a moment. 